Good morning. Quickly turn to the person on your right and left and give them a big old smile. Welcome everyone to Williams. If you are visiting with us this morning, you get to do something really fun. Go to the end of your pew. Hopefully there's a sheet of paper slender has a couple of questions that we would love for you to fill out so we could just have a record of your visit, that's all. And then you're going to put it in the offering plate when it comes your way in a few minutes. Um, but everyone else, open up your bulletins. Look with me. And we'll start with the announcement on the back of the bulletin about the reflective address markers. And I have the handsome Matt McFall going to make that announcement, so come on down. Good morning. Um, as Nikki said, on the back of the bulletin, you can see those, and, and you may have gotten a flyer. We've got some in the foyer, and I think there's some in the back, too. Um, these go on your mailboxes, and I mean, I can tell you from experience, I had a call the other night, and I missed the house because there was nothing on the mailbox, and it takes a couple of minutes to turn a big fire truck around in the middle of the road. So, you know, every second counts, so just make sure you get one of these because it, it'll definitely help. Um, also, if any of you came to the open house up here at the, at the new station, you may have saw the yellow dot program. And uh, I'm going to get more information on that, but I thought while I was coming up here to tell you about these, I would just mention that right quick. What that is is it gives you a list of, like, you can put all your prescriptions on this list. You keep it in your glove box, and on the back of your car, if you choose, you can put a yellow dot sticker on there. That way, if you have an accident or something happens and you're unconscious, a first responder that comes on scene will see that yellow dot. They'll know to go look in the glove box and see what prescriptions and things that you have. That way they can treat you properly and not give you something that you're not supposed to have. Um, if you're, like I said, if you're unconscious, they can't respond and tell them things. So I'm gonna get that information and, and get it probably back in the office or in the four years because you actually have to have your picture taken and, and put with that material in the glove box. So that's just something to be thinking about. So just have that in your head that we'll get that going too. So thank you. Thank you, Matt. Okay, um, make sure that you come back tonight. We will continue our study of, book, of the book of Jonah, and that will start at 6 o'clock here in the sanctuary. Okay, and right after church this morning, youth, I need uh, y'all all to go to the courtyard for a picture, and then we'll have lunch bunch afterwards. And anybody else who wants to come eat lunch with us, right after church, we'll be going. Um, next Sunday night, it's not in the bulletin, but let me tell you about it. it. We'll be having our annual Super Bowl party, which we also like to call it a crock pot cook-off and a dessert bake-off. So be thinking about that this week, what you would like to bring and enter in the uh, competition and um, Sam Prickett he's been uh, our winner the past two years so with him off to college I'll have a chance okay <laughs> so bring your crock pot and your dessert and we're just gonna watch the game there'll be some door prizes for all of you um, but that will be next Sunday night at five o'clock okay um, and also make sure that you come this coming Wednesday night for service at 530 we have supper and there is the menu in the bulletin get your name on the list if you are not on the list already to eat and then church will be at 630 okay and make sure that you read over all the other information in the bulletin it's there for a reason okay all right so now time to stand back up and find someone to say good morning to
Well, good morning again. Uh, I have just two sort of addition. I'm going to make the youth announcements this morning since Nikki made the church announcements. Um, one thing, uh, there are uh, some times available for snack, which uh, is, does, doesn't just mean you get to eat snacks. I think that means it's Sunday night after church. So if you want to host the youth and whoever else would like to come <laughs> at your house, uh, please sign up for that. Let me tell you, that is the best way uh, to get to know our awesome youth group, to know, uh, get to just fellowship with each other. And also, along those same lines, if you are a junior or senior, or parents of a junior or senior, uh, two weeks from today, February 8th, at 6 o'clock here at the church, we're, uh, the financial aid department from JSU is going to be here to talk about filling out the FAFSA. And if you have a junior or a youth in uh, high school, you know exactly what that is. And if you don't, and you have a junior and a senior, you need to be here. Uh, the fast, you cannot get any financial aid without filling out that form. And there will be people here just to sort of help you fill that out, know what that means to fill it out, good ways to do that. It's a very important thing. So if you uh, have teenagers, especially juniors and seniors in high school, or if you yourself are thinking about going back to school, be here for that. I think it will be a very, very important uh, meeting that we'll have and some, a lot of good information uh, will be given. So uh, as we've come together this morning to join with one another in worship, let us join our hearts and minds together with a word of prayer. Great God, we thank you for another day, another day when we, Lord, are given the gift of worship. And Lord, as we have gathered in this place, we are mindful that there are those, Lord, and our families and our friends and the fellowship of this congregation who in these last days have lost loved ones, whose family members are ill. And God, we pray for them. We pray that your Holy Spirit be with them, that you lift them up, that we lift them up to you, God, and that you just move in their lives in very powerful present ways. And God, for those who can't be here with us this morning, for whatever reason, God, we pray for them, that your Holy Spirit be with them. And for those of us gathered in this room, Lord, we pray that you speak to us. Show us, Lord, who you are as we sing songs of praise, as we offer up prayers and our offerings, as we hear from Holy Scripture. Speak to us, Holy Spirit, we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning's scripture call to worship is 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 29 through 31. I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy, sorry, and those who buy as though they had no possessions. And those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. grace that taught my heart to be and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my 
chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing Thank you, Lindy, for, first of all, for sharing your talent, and then also being brave enough for me to accompany you. <laughs> it was kind of pretty impromptu thing, so we just got together this morning, but she did a great job. Uh, our first hymn this morning is hymn number 113, I Just Came to Praise the Lord. We'll sing all three stanzas and ask three stanzas. Our next hymn is hymn number 529, Oh How I Love Jesus. We'll sing all four stanzas.
Okay, well, you guys had better be talkative this morning. There's only four of you. So everybody's got some talking. Um, Ada looks at me with horror. Um, <laughs> let, me, um, let me ask you a question. What's, now, you've done ballet recitals before. You've done ballet. You play, do you play baseball yet? You watch, the, you watch brother play baseball. So if you were in the middle of something like that, if you were in the middle of a ballet recital and, and, or, or a game, and somebody came up to you and just said, drop everything, we got to go, would you do it? No. No. <laughs> why? Why not? Because you you have to do your thing. You have to do your thing. You're up there to do a job, and you feel like, well, if somebody comes up and says, "Drop everything," you're not supposed to do that, right? Mm-mm. What do you think? Um, what do you think would happen if you did? Uh-huh. You don't know. If you left, if you just everybody's out there dancing, and you left in the middle of a ballet recital, what do you think? What do you think would happen? Someone would start chasing you. Someone would start chasing you. Okay. <laughs> Miss Colleen would chase you off the stage. Um, what if it was your parents that stuck their heads out from backstage and said, hey, you've got to drop everything. Let's go. Well, do, you think, do you think you'd be more likely to do it? Uh, yes. Yeah? How come? Because Because I'm the one asking you the question and you can't say no. <laughs> <laughs> um, because they're your parents. So do you think that it must be really important if they're the ones that are asking you to do it? Yeah? Okay. So that's that's a little bit different. So if it's your parents, you might drop everything, even if it's something important. Yeah. And if you're afraid you might get in trouble if you leave, you figure if your parents are asking you, it must be really important, right? Mm-hmm. So there are a couple things that we can, we can learn from our answers to some of those questions. Sometimes when you get a b- bit bigger, or sometimes maybe even now, God is just going to ask you to drop everything and do what he wants you to do and um, that can be really hard because it's like leaving a baseball game while you're on the pitcher's mound or leaving a ballet recital or right in the middle of a number because people are going to look at you funny and you, you might think that you're going to get in trouble or if you if you had to drop a test right in the middle for some reason and you might think well I'm going to fail but if somebody really important like your mom or dad says you got to go right in the middle of this test you do it anyway because you know it's really important. It's more important than that, right? The teacher would probably say, I have to explain it. Mm-hmm. So, so we can learn, I guess, that um, we need to know. If we know that at one point God might ask us to drop everything, even, even if it seems really important, <coughs> that we've got to know who's asking us, right? We've got to be able to trust God and know God well enough in advance that when he comes and says drop everything, we trust him even more than we trust our parents that what he's saying is really important. So how do we know God well enough to do that? How do we learn to know God really well so that we would know when he's talking to us? What do you do to, to, to talk to God? What do you do to listen to God? Do you pray? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you listen to Sunday school lessons? Do you listen to your parents? <laughs> Did you just shake your head? <laughs> he was the one shaking his no, head. No, but um, so we need to know God in advance, so that we know when it's okay for us to drop everything. And we got to remember that what God wants us to do is more important than all that other stuff. God, what God wants us to do is more important than even disappointing your baseball team, or failing a test, or people looking at you funny. Doing doing what God wants you to do is more important than all that. So we got to know what He. We got to know his voice when he wants us to drop everything, and we got to be ready to do it. Does that sound good? <coughs> well, you're good then. All right, guys. You two can go back because we don't have children's church this morning. But you two do. So head on out. There goes Abby. Go follow Abby. <laughs> Our hymn this morning is hymn number 563, Count Your Blessings. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth stanzas. As you stand as we sing.
of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come this morning thanking you for the chance to gather together here in your house and in your name. Give us a giving spirit, Father, a loving spirit, that when we come to chances in our lives to do something great for others, uh, give us the strength to do it, Father. We thank you for loving your children. In Jesus' name, amen.
The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the first chapter of Mark's Gospel. This morning we'll be there in chapter 1 of Mark, reading verses 14 through 20. Mark chapter 1, beginning of verse 14. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Great God, as we come now to this time, we ask, Lord, that you speak to us, that we may hear your words, that they may change us, while my words are quickly forgotten. Speak to us, Holy Spirit, through the words of Holy Scripture, as we are gathered in this place. In the name of Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Have you ever had to just drop everything because you got that phone call or that text message. Maybe it was your brother calling you to tell you mom's been picked up by an ambulance and it's on the way to the hospital and she's asked for you by name. Or maybe you were at work and the phone rang and it was the school. I, I, you need to come pick your son up. He's had an accident in class and well you just need to come get him. Or maybe Maybe you felt your phone buzz in your pocket. And so when you pull it out, there on the screen, it simply says, Help, I need you. You left everything where it was. Tools on the ground, books and papers all over your desk, milk on the counter. Because you know that there are some things in life that are far more important than the things that are right there, right in front of you at the moment. And maybe, maybe there's something in the back of your mind that puts you just a little at ease that, don't worry, this will all be over soon, the panic will subside, things will get back to normal, it'll all be alright soon enough, and things can get back to normal in time. You'll eventually return to the job site, eventually get back to your office, eventually get back around to cleaning up the mess you left behind in such a hurry. You may drop what you're doing, but you'll pick it back up again eventually. There are those in our world, however, who are forced to drop everything they're doing, to leave it all behind, and not because of a phone call or a text message. There are those who are forced to leave everything by the end of a gun. Some are driven from their countries by the threat of war and persecution. Still others are forced to leave behind all that they have as devastating floods wash away their homes, as droughts dry up what's left of hope, and all other sorts of natural disasters try their best to erase their existence from the landscape. Over these past months, we've heard news of Ukrainian refugees who are leaving their homes during times of military actions and political unrest. Over the last week and a half in the African country of Malawi, floodwaters have left over 200,000 people displaced, tens of thousands removed from the rest of civilization. And just a little over two weeks ago, we marked the fifth anniversary of an earthquake that struck what was already the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, the earthquake that rocked Haiti, killing thousands and leaving tens of thousands of others displaced. A country many of us have seen with our own eyes is still 
yet to recover. There are too many stories to count, too many stories to count of those in our world who have had to drop everything, to leave it all behind, to never see it again, to carry on into an uncertain future. Unfortunately, the stories of these refugees, of these misplaced brothers and sisters, are stories of desperation. Stories that speak to the, of those who have had no other choice, those whom the waves of war and weather have forced to move. Their stories are not stories of choice, of choosing to relocate, of seeking greener pastures through immigration. Theirs are not stories of the free decision to trek into the unknown in search of something new, something exciting. Theirs are not stories of adventure. And yet at first glance this morning, the story we've read may seem like one of those kinds of stories. Two sets of two brothers, bored with the monotonous rhythms of the fishing life there on Lake Galilee, decide to strike out to seek adventure with the wandering rabbi from Nazareth. So they leave their nets, their boats, their father, and they set out on this grand coming-of-age adventure from which they'll come back wiser and more capable of dealing with the realities of adulthood. Yes, perhaps this story seems like the telling of a quartet of men ready to leave behind the family business in order to strike out on their own. It sounds almost like a story of adventure. But it's so much more than that. Now I'm sure many of you in this room here this morning have heard this story before. Maybe you've heard it in VBS, maybe you've heard it in Sunday school, or maybe you've even heard it from this very pulpit in this very room. You've likely heard it recounted as an exemplary tale of how we all ought to respond to the call of Jesus, how we all ought to be willing to stop everything we're doing, cock our ear towards the Holy Spirit, and listen to Jesus and follow Him. Now, that's a great lesson, but I don't necessarily think it's the point of this story, at least not the whole point of this story. Now, at first, I suppose you could chalk this scene up to a necessary bit of exposition, uh, a way to explain how Jesus got his first few followers. Mark already jumps in to the gospel. I guess he couldn't jump all the way in, and you just expect to know these people. So we could chalk this up as to just a way to explain how he got them. I mean, in Mark's language, it's pretty short and to the point. Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, saw Simon, saw his brother Andrew, casting a net into the sea, and Jesus says, Hey, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And straight away, as Mark does, we're told, and immediately they left their nets and followed him. Nearly the exact same thing happens when Jesus is within earshot of James and John, the sons of Zebedee. In fact, it takes fewer words to express the interaction between Jesus and Zebedee's boys. It says, immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with their hired men and followed him. There's no discussion among the brothers, no conversation about the consequences of following this this traveling rabbi from Nazareth. No discussion of any kind. The author of Mark's Gospel, as he so often does, simply states the facts in order to move the narrative along. After all, we don't want to spend too much time on the shores of Galilee. We've got to get to the cross. That's Mark's momentum. Jesus called four fishermen to follow him, and they left their stuff and followed him. That's That's the way this narrative is moving. But hang on a minute. Before we get too swept up in that forward momentum, before we get too swept up in where this story is going, I think we need to take a minute to really think about what has happened in this story. While those of us reading it some 20 centuries later, we may know all of where this thing is going, but think about it for a minute. Andrew, Peter, James, and John had no way of knowing what it was they were signing up for. But they had every idea about what it was they were leaving behind. You see, while Mark's gospel may be short on intricate details, short on specific plot points, the details it does give us are ones that we need to pay attention to. 
In verse 16, the gospel tells us, as Jesus passes by Simon and Andrew, they're casting their nets into the sea. For, Mark tells us, they were fishermen. Now maybe to you that seems pretty obvious. Uh, but the intention here is to point out that these are not two brothers casually on their day off sinking a line out into the deepest parts of the water and catching up on the football game. These men are professionals. Men whose job it was to cast a net out into the sea, to pull the fish into the boat, the haul, the catch, onto the shore, and into the market. In fact, all four of these men are professionals. And they are all presumably a part of their respective families' businesses. They're providers, not only for their families, but their economic driving forces in the communities. But then here comes Jesus all strolling along, acting like nothing's going on, proclaiming the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent, believe in the good news. And what do they do? They take him at his word. They drop everything and leave it all there on the shore to follow him. Now for so long, it's been the immediate response of these four that has been held up as an example of how we ought to respond when Christ calls. And it should be. Don't misunderstand me. But I'm afraid we've missed something. I'm afraid we've watered down the response of these four men to an example of immediate response and nothing more. To just how a snap of his fingers, Jesus calls us and we're supposed to just change our minds. That is to say, it seems to me We've held this story up as proof that conversion, or perhaps a better word, discipleship, is something that happens immediately and internally. We've based that all on the immediate response of these fishermen to Christ's call. All the while, all the while though, I think we've actually ignored the call that Christ gives in the first place. And in doing so, I think we've missed the real point of these men's obedience. In verse 15, we hear about how Jesus comes by the lake in Galilee. He's proclaiming the good news. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Jesus' message is building on that of John the baptizer we heard just a few verses before. And then, when Jesus comes to these fishermen, his message is simple. Follow me. And I will make you fish for people. It's at that request, that call, that these men leave their nets, their father, and the hired men, and go. Now I want you to hear that again. They leave their nets, their families, their employees, everything to follow Jesus. In a very real sense, they leave behind their security their comfort, everything they've ever known, they leave it behind in an instant to follow Jesus. And I want you to understand, this isn't simply just them asking Jesus into their hearts. This isn't some cognitive acceptance of their divinity of Jesus. This isn't four men agreeing about their collective theological assumptions about salvation. This is four men actively, physically leaving behind what they know to be secure what they know to be comfortable. They leave behind their sociological obligations in order to follow Jesus. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. They can't possibly know what they're doing. They can't possibly know what it is they're getting into. Sure, all of us in here, we know because we can flip the pages and find out. We know about the Sermon on the Mount. We know about the feeding of the 5,000, the healing of the sick and the blind, the bringing Lazarus back to death. We know about the cross, the tomb, and the resurrection. But these four men, they don't know that. They've been fishing, and this man comes by and says, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. They have no way of knowing what's in store for them as they follow Jesus. And yet, they actively choose to do it. And that's the other thing. When Jesus calls them, he doesn't call them to simply tag along and watch. He doesn't say, come follow me and see what I'm going to do. 
He says, follow me and I will make you fish for people. The call of Christ is not simply a private individual call to salvation. It is a call to a public active vocation. When Jesus calls us, it is not simply so we can rest assured that our souls may rejoice in the comfort of knowing we'll go to heaven when we die. When Jesus calls us, it is a call to be active, to actively leave behind more of who we are, that we may take hold of more of who he is. It's not simply a call to sit back and watch. It's a call that we may actively set out into the world, and not simply to decry its sinfulness and point out its shortcomings, but to change it, to change it for the better. It is a call to actively draw others into the net of God's all-sufficient love. It's a call that comes, yes, in a moment, in something as casual as a rabbi strolling by the shore, but it is a call that requires a lifetime of commitment, a lifetime of obedience. A lifetime of trust. It is a call that beckons us to follow Jesus to places we haven't been. And the situations we have yet to experience to people we have yet to meet. It's a call that comes ringing, yes, with hope, joy, and love. But it is also a call that comes with the risks. The risks of bold action. The risk of following one who loves the unlovable, cares for the forgotten, the one who, though he is God, poured himself out to us, got his hands dirty, playing with children and washing feet. We know. We know there are going to be these kinds of risks. We know that there are risks in following such a Savior. For the very first words of the text we've read this morning Well, they color the whole passage with its subtle shade. The very first words. Now, after John was arrested, John the baptizer came to find out the risks that were involved with following Jesus. He knew the risks of proclaiming repentance to those who believed they had nothing to repent of. He knew the risks of calling to action those whose inaction and apathy had made them comfortable. He came to learn that following Jesus, it's not always the easy choice. These fishermen would come to learn that lesson as well. As have so many down through the centuries who have taken up the call of Christ, those who have put their faith to action by living their lives in very real ways for the gospel. Those those who left their nets, They learned those lessons. But most of all, they learned that living a life in obedience to Christ is the ultimate source of joy. For it's a call not just to hardships, it is a call to be actively loved by God and to actively love God as we love others, as we draw others into that net of love. Jesus is calling all of us today. Here we are on the shores of Galilee, and the Savior is strolling by. He's calling us to be fishers of people, to leave our nets on the shore, to leave behind what we know to be safe and comfortable in order to follow Him. That means leaving behind our fears of what we don't understand. That means getting up from the sidelines and actually getting into the game. That means actually getting involved rather than sitting back and pointing out what you think is wrong. The call of Christ is to be more than an observer, more than a critic, more than a passive participant in the ways of this world. It is a call to do something. So may you be fishers of people. May you be the ones who leave your nets on the shore. May you be the ones who takes the risk of following Jesus out into the unknown. May you get up off the sidelines and into the game. May you trade your critiques for actions, 
Your observations for engagement. Your stillness for movement. Your indifference for love. And may you hear the voice of Jesus calling you this morning. Calling you to come and follow. And may you live each moment from this one forward in a lifelong obedience to that call. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we hear you calling us. Our nets are in our hands. Lord, give us the strength to leave them. Give us the courage, Lord, to get up and get involved. Give us, Lord, the power of the Holy Spirit to heed your calling to go out into the world to change it. Lord, may your Holy Spirit be with us this morning. Speak to us. Call us, Lord. And may we be found faithful to respond. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. hymn of invitation this morning is hymn number 373 where he leads me we'll sing the first and second stanza please stand As you go forth from this place this morning, may you listen as Christ is calling. And with your nets in your hands, may you leave them behind and follow Christ into the unknown, wherever it is he may be calling you. Would you pray with me as we're dismissed? Lord Jesus Christ, we hear your voice. And Holy Spirit, we pray for courage. As we go out forth from this place, from this time of worship, Go with us and speak to us. In your name we pray. Amen.